little bit of English. Good afternoon. I would just like to start by saying that I am not a feminist. The number of funny looks that I got from my friends when I told them I'd be talking about women's voices in the family archive bears witness to this. As my MA research showed, the number of women's archives in the National Library of Israel was small, but representative of the lack of women's voices in history. Now, of course, there are more. Family archives are different. Women are an integral part of them. They don't have to have been important enough to have had their own archive. A family archive gives unique space and expression to the women of the family, <coughs> since historically, this has been their domain. This idea is developed by Pedro Albano in his article, Women Writing and Family Archives, The Missing Story. And as one of the archivists who arranged and described the Sassoon Family Archive in the National Library of Israel, one of my colleagues sitting over there, um, I decided I would like to use it as a case study to explore his ideas. The lecture will bring examples from the voices of women found in the Sassoon Family Archive, not only of individual figures, but also as documentation of the wider family and social networks that they were part of, and which enabled them to remain informed and influence events, and which allow us to set their stories in a wider, meaningful, con meaningful context and enrich our historical knowledge. In other words, I will be looking at the family archive as a unique historical source for the marginalized voices in society. I'm not a feminist, I've become a social historian. <laughs> the main topics of the talk will include a brief look at Urbano's ideas and the importance of family archives as a source for writing women's history, an introduction to the Sassoons of Baghdad and their family archive, examples from the archive to illustrate some of Urbano's points, and finally, I will share with you how we find solutions to identity challenges we face when describing the archive, what I have called here the Rachel Factor. Just one point, for technical reasons, none of the illustrations come from the Sassoon archive. Instead, I've used pictures from other archives at the National Library, either of family members, such as Professor Avon Halevi Frankel and Professor Avon Shom Yehuda, or people in close contact with Sassoons, such as Valdemar Khafkin. actually came to this subject because of Obano's article on women writing and family archives. Briefly, he talks about the change in the historiography of women from the classical approach, as with general history, which documented famous personalities or women in elite circles through their actions in the public sphere, to the social history approach, which focused on the study of everyday lives and marginalized groups such as women. Sources were few, and many were often written by men, so they tended to reflect a male view of women. Obano then suggests that the direct history of women, written by them about themselves, can be found where women have been confined for centuries, the domestic space. In his opinion, this is where family archives are special. <coughs> the basic components in any archive, such as correspondence and ego documents, such as diaries and journals, are platforms for a range of personal expression from private thoughts and family intrigues to opinions on current events, the arts, medical issues, and the latest fashions. They reflect contemporary fashions and allow us to reconstruct the biographies of their authors, their daily lives, their relations, and social networks. These ego documents present us with information that is not usually included in official sources and therefore provide us with a richer, broader, and more complete historical narrative. In a family archive, where women play a part, these documents enable them to tell their story and fit themselves both into the nuclear and wider family context and hierarchy, and also into the social context that they were part of. The family archive does not exclude the public roles of women, but allows us to see and hear about them in a family context and from personal perspectives. <coughs> In order to understand the scope and background of the archive, I would like to start with a few basic details about the Baghdadi diaspora and the Sassoon family. The Baghdadi diaspora began with itinerant merchant traders from Baghdad and Aleppo in the 18th century. They established Judeo-Arabic speaking Jewish communities in India and then branched out all over Asia, as you can see here on the map. Flourishing under the British Empire in the 19th century, 
they adopted the English language and British orientation, including dress. By the 1970s, however, almost all the communities had disappeared. One such family was the Sassoon family from Baghdad. David Sassoon left due to persecutions in the early 19th century. In 1832, he established a trading company in Bombay called David Sassoon and Sons, later becoming David Sassoon and Company Limited. It focused on banking and property investments, but soon also began to deal in commodities such as precious metals, silks, spices, wool, and wheat, later specializing in Indian cotton yarn and opium from Bombay to China. It set up branches in Bombay, Calcutta, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Japan, Baghdad, London, and Manchester, although the last few cities did not appear on the map. Later, David's second son, Elias, broke away and set up his own business, Ely Sassoon Company. The Sassoon family were known as the Rothschilds of the East because of the great wealth that they accumulated. This was not the only similarity to the Rothschilds. David Sassoon also sent his sons to different countries to head the newly established branches of the business. The family tree in the picture is very simplified and partially inaccurate, but it shows David Sassoon, the founder of the dynasty, with his first wife, Hannah Joseph. He had two sons and two daughters by his first wife, and another ten children by his second wife, Flora Haim, one of whom was Solomon David Sassoon, whose family is the backbone of our archive. In contrast to what you see here, the family tree that we use while arranging the Sassoon family archive is 16 pages long, covers 250 years, and includes an invaluable index of names. It was compiled by family member Sybil Sassoon, finished in 2007, it's about 100 years later, and was sent to me by David Sassoon's great, great, great granddaughter, Joanna Sassoon, who lives in Australia and is also an archivist. <laughs> she gave me What's her name? Joanna Sassoon. Um, and she showed me her pedigree as well. Um, in 1872, David Sassoon and Company moved its offices from Bombay to London for better access to markets. The next year, Abdallah, or Albert as he preferred, settled in England and directed the family business from London, from 12 Leadenhall Street. He joined his brothers Reuben and Arthur, who were already there. The family moved in the higher circles of Anglo-Jewish and English society. Solomon was left to run the business in Bombay until his death in 1894, when his wife Flora took over. She became a prominent businesswoman herself until ousted from her post by the brothers. Dividing her time between India and England, she settled permanently in London in 1911 with her three children, Rachel, David, and Mazel. As already mentioned, the family archive focuses on this English branch of the family. This can be explained by the fact that Flora's son, David Solomon Sassoon, was the original family archivist. The archive is structured around descendants of Solomon and Flora Sassoon. The importance of the women in the family can be seen by the fact that we decided to give each woman a fonds or a shared one with their husband. Urbano concentrates on correspondence and ego documents as expressions of hidden voices. These modes of expression developed during the 19th century, especially among bourgeois women, due to growing literacy and levels of education. We know that Sassoon women were educated and cultured as we have their exercise books in various languages, scrapbooks, and notebooks with the rules of social etiquette. It is important to mention that this family archive contains many account books kept by the women of the family who ran their households, and these tell the financial and administrative side of domestic activity. We also have a number of artifacts in the archive which add to the hidden story. Boxes from ladies' skin creams, Flora Sassoon's traveling trunk, hair from first haircuts, probably kept by mothers, mm -hmm pieces of material with dress patterns, photographs, and dry pressed flowers. The archive has a cast of hundreds, spans over 40 shelf meters, and is much too large and fascinating for a 20 minute talk. Due to my time limit, I've chosen to only bring examples from correspondence files, as the written interaction introduces a wide variety of voices. The nanny was an integral part of genteel English family life. She was responsible for the children's day-to-day -day needs and arrangements, not the sort of person who would necessarily leave footprints for historical researchers or have an archive of her own. As an integral part of Sassoon family life, Miss Alice Moore Thompson, known to the family as Nanny Thompson, is documented in the family archive as a trusted carer of generations of the family. The archive contains letters to Alice Nanny Thompson 
between the years 1929 and 1978, including letters from Selina from Holland in the 1930s, letters from Selina's grandchildren, Isaac and David, in the 1960s, and birthday cards sent and received by her. Finally, in correspondence between Solomon and Alice Sassoon and Margaret May, we learn that Nanny Thompson has been in hospital, that she is living with and being cared for in her old age by Solomon and Alice in Letchworth, and that she has even dictated the letter to Solomon from Margaret May to thank her for magazines she has sent from Canada. Younger sons might go into the business or the army or become friends with the Prince of Wales, but what of younger daughters who are invalids and confined to bed for most of the time? They were unlikely to be heard of or from. Mazelle Sassoon was the younger sister to Flora's other children, Rachel and David. The archive contains her diaries, her exercise books, correspondence with her siblings, including a snake skin sent her by her sister Rachel, and with her sister-in-law, aunts and cousins. From the notes and letters in the archive that she wrote to her mother, there emerges a picture of a child, even in her 20s, who is painfully grateful to her mother for any attention she shows her and she often only hears reports of family events second-hand. Perhaps most moving is a handwritten note on a scrap of paper that she wrote on January the 7th, 1913, concerning her wishes to be buried in Jerusalem, wherever she might die. Her two siblings married in November and December 1912, and one wonders whether these events influenced her letter, or whether her medical condition took a turn for the worse. The notes in Flora's fonts, and we know that after Mazel's death in 1921, Flora took it upon herself to bring Mazel's body to the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem for burial in a plot that she acquired there. She is buried there. Yeah. While princesses and wives of governors may make the history books, their own voices and accounts of their experiences and feelings can usually only be found in correspondence with confidants with whom they have formed close friendships. In Flora's correspondence files, there is at least one such letter from 1916, written in French and signed Prem Corp. A one-time Spanish flamenco dancer and singer from Andalusia, Anita Delgado Briones achieved fame for having married the Indian Maharaja of Karpothala and for changing her name to Rani Prem Kaur Sahiba. A long-term relationship forged between Flora Sassoon and Fanny Georgiana Jane Mackay, Lady Ray, is documented in the family archive. Lord Ray was governor of Bombay from 1885 to 1890 and under Secretary of State for India between 1894 and 1895. The acquaintance between the two women seems to have begun by Lady Albert Sassoon. Lady Ray, who would take responsibility for the Bombay Female Medical Education Scheme, wrote a letter to Lady Sassoon in 1885 about training native nurses, midwives, and female doctors. And in a letter written shortly afterwards, Lady Ray states that she is happy to have Mrs. Sassoon, a Flora, on board. There are no fewer than 15 files of letters between Lady Ray and Flora Sassoon between the years 1885 and 1911 about border parties, charity and social work, family matters, invitations to lunch and to visit, and even some advice from Lady Ray to Flora about what colour dress Rachel Sassoon should wear when she is presented at court in 1907. The Sassoon family archive stretches from Shanghai to Bombay and Calcutta, through Aleppo, Hong Kong, London, and Letchworth. Even the close family is spread abroad, with Flora's daughter Rachel moving to Calcutta after marrying Sir David Ezra in 1912, and two of Flora's sisters, Kate Judah and Rebecca Sommer, living respectively in Bombay and Shanghai. Since letter writing is the only way of keeping in touch regularly, there are numerous files of letters between Rachel Ezra and her mother from 1912 to Flora's death in 1936. They are mainly written in English, often include newspaper cuttings with comments about thoughts on contemporary events, and cover all possible subjects. There are at least five files of letters between Flora's sisters Kate and Rebecca, and Flora Sassoon and Rachel Ezra. The correspondence with Flora is all in Judeo-Arabic. From these and other family letters, the archive is full of family news and gossip, daily life and entertainment, who was visiting who, who was marrying who, and of course, who was not talking to who. <laughs> we also learn details about important events in the family. In a file of condolence letters written mainly by female family members to Flora in 1929, we discover that her two sisters, Kate and Rebecca, died within 24 hours of each other, that Rebecca died suddenly while visiting Flora in England, and that Rebecca seems to have been the more popular of the two. 
the letters do not only give us a picture of people being written about, but also give us a glimpse of the thoughts and character of those writing the letters. One writer states, it would be impossible to think of Shanghai without Rebecca. While another adds to her good owners, which is that it was so lucky Rebecca did not die on the train. What would have people thought? <laughs> The archive also provides us with evidence of the relationship between Selina and her mother and sisters. And through these women, we have a glimpse of daily life on a personal and wider level in Holland, Germany, and Palestine of the time. This network provides us with an interesting insight into one of the activities of the Sassoon family women, helping refugees from the Nazis. Correspondence from 1938 to 39 contains desperate letters from ordinary women writing to Selina for help to get themselves or their relatives out of Germany. Sometimes the women mention a mutual acquaintance or while of Selina's sisters, but at least one woman simply writes that Selina doesn't know her, but she has heard that Selina can help people leave Germany. One success story involved Miss Alice Benjamin from Frankfurt, who was told by Selina's sister, Meta Posen, to write to Selina. Selina jotted down on Alice's letter the name and address of Mrs. Miller, who agreed to host the German girl. Mrs. Miller wrote to invite Alice to come, and Alice informed Selina about this with a comment that she hoped she would be able to thank her personally. Alice Benjamin managed to leave Germany and come to England in 1939. We can assume that she did meet Selina and thank her personally, since Selina's son Solomon married Alice Benjamin in 1943. Of course, one challenge in arranging correspondence in the family archive is family names. It was not unusual for us to have a letter to Flora or Rachel Ezra signed by Rachel. The challenge was, which one? This is a short list of possible candidates, and it doesn't include non-family members <coughs> such as Rachel Cohen. Fortunately, we had a 16-page family tree that Joanna sent us with its index of names. This is only from two generations. As well as comparing the signatures, which were often similar, we can bend the handwriting on the letters, some of which was very distinctive, like that of Rachel Ezra, as you can see here, and was more helpful than just the one word signature. We kept notes on the addresses that appeared on the letters, whether they were in Bombay, London, or Paris. Sometimes different addresses appeared on letters that we knew were written by the same Rachel. And we had to remember that during the summer months, families would head up to the hills in India in search of cooler weather. Family also travel to Europe, so there are hotel addresses in France and Switzerland which are not fixed abodes. Sometimes the content of the letters gave us clues. If the letter mentioned siblings or aunts and uncles by name, we could search the appropriate branch of the family. Sometimes the letter would include the name of a different Rachel, which helped us conclude that she couldn't be the writer of the letter. One-off letters were the hardest to identify. One Rachel often wrote to Flora and Rachel Ezra on the same letter as Aline. Rachel addressed Flora by her first name, and Aline wrote to Aunt Flora. There was obviously a generation gap here, quite possibly mother and daughter. Rachel Ezra, they simply both addressed as Rachel. They mainly wrote from the same address in Bombay, 101 Esplanade Parade, parade except when they didn't. The ink was usually purple, except when it was green. Occasionally, Ezekiel added a short comment or was cited by Rachel as sending his regards. One letter to Rachel Ezra referred to Rachel David, Another referred to Rachel Hine. Logic dictated that neither of these Rachels could have been writing the letters. With help from the family tree, we decided we were talking about Rachel Elkabe Abraham and their children, Aline and Ezekiel. Rachel was married to Abraham Abraham, Flora's brother, which would fit. But then on one such letter, a note had been added at the end of the letter in Rachel Abraham's handwriting, but signed RG. Back to the family tree, where you saw that Rachel Abraham's maiden name had been goodbye. This has been a very brief journey of discovery of women's voices in the Sassoon family archive. These voices were heard because of the family archive setting. These are the voices that give social historians their primary sources for a more complete, richer, and more realistic writing of women's and journal history. Thank you. Well.